Prince Pénade, rien que pour nous pendant une heure. Alors simplement, euh, si vous voulez prendre un casque pour euh, avoir la traduction euh, de l'anglais vers le français, ça se passe juste derrière le premier pilier. Et on vous demandera à la fin de la séance et bien tout simplement de ramener pour qu'on puisse les, les remettre euh, en charge. Alors on a la chance d'avoir euh, Norman Spinrad. Norman Spinrad, c'est euh, un des grands auteurs euh, de, de la science-fiction depuis... Euh, euh, la fin des années 60, le début des années 70. Euh, il est né en 1940, euh, voilà, euh, et à New York, euh, très exactement. Et puis, pour vous citer quelques œuvres, mais on va y revenir, hein, on, on va s'arrêter sur tout ça. Il y avait évidemment Jacques Baron et l'éternité, évidemment Rêve de fer, euh, Oussama, il est parmi nous, le temps du rêve, ce sont des, des livres qui sont un petit peu plus près euh, de nous, mais on va commencer, on va revenir au tout début, euh, normal. Quels étaient vos auteurs favoris et qu'est-ce qui vous a donné envie de faire de la science-fiction C'est le science-fiction, tous les livres, tout le monde. Je ne sais pas si c'est le cas. Les science-fiction que j'ai vraiment apprécié étaient Alfred Bester, Philip Dick, Theodore Sturgeon. Mais en même temps, j'ai lu d'autres choses, j'ai lu Jack Kerouac et um, um, Norman Mailer. Je n'ai jamais trouvé mon livre à la science-fiction. J'ai aussi lu les EC, les horror comics, des choses comme ça. Donc, j'ai eu une enfant littéraire qui était un peu différente de ce que les gens qui ont écrit la science-fiction, je suppose. Um, I, I read comics, I read uh, science fiction magazines, but I was also reading a, a wide variety of other things. Qu'est-ce qui vous a donné envie d'écrire euh, spécifiquement de la science fiction Vous auriez pu faire euh, du polar ou d'autres choses. Qu'est-ce qui vous a donné l'étincelle Well, uh, on the one hand, I was reading a lot of science fiction, so it was sort of natural to start reading the sort of thing, uh, to, to start writing the sort of thing I was reading, but I did not even know that um, the genre and subculture and fandom and all of that even existed until I had published two novels. Um, so I, I really began writing science fiction for literary reasons, um, because uh, it was a kind of visionary, li uh, a, a, a visionary li literature, it was a literature in which you invented everything, you invented the world, you invented the consciousness of the characters, and it was really a kind of literary freedom. And the other sort of stuff that I was, that I was reading before I started writing, for instance, uh, Oh, Mark Twain, Henry Miller, William Burroughs, uh, not, not Edgar Rice Burroughs, um, uh, and writers like that were doing something somehow related to it, that, that it was much more interesting to me. Well, years later what I said was that a lot of um, conventional uh, literary literature, whatever that means, um, was that science fiction treated matters of cosmic importance uh, with, uh, in a trivial manner, whereas liter so-called literary science fiction, uh, literary fiction, uh, used a great deal of talent and literary imagination to examine the lint in its own navel. Um, so I came to science fiction for literary reasons, for the freedom Uh, the creative freedom it gave you. Uh, later on, I found out that there was a, a genre, that there was a, a various limitations on it, things like that. But I, I did not come to it uh, as a fan of a, of a genre, to say. Parmi vos, vos romans, je voudrais qu'on qu qu fasse un premier arrêt sur Jacques Baron et l'éternité, qui est un, désormais un classique. Euh, Qu'est-ce qui vous a donné envie de l'écrire Comment est-ce qu'est né ce roman Well, first of all, it's not my first novel. Um, uh, well, um, I had the idea that, uh, sort of like what I was just talking about, that science fiction 
had written a lot of things about immortality, always. But nobody had really dealt with the idea of what the reality would be like, which would be, it would initially be for very rich people. Uh, there would be a transition. Uh, whoever might uh, gain control of, uh, economic control of, of, of something like that, or even somebody who people believed had economic control of something like that, would be extraordinarily powerful. Hence Benedict Howard and the Foundation for Human Immortality. And then I had asked myself, in order to write a novel, what car, where would there be, how could there be another political power uh, that was equally powerful? And then the answer was fairly obvious, that was television, well, media. And at that time I was reading Marshall McLuhan's Understanding Media, which is a very profound book about how media, and he was talking about old media too, the changeover from uh, oral tradition to print, and then to uh, mass printing, and then to radio, and film, and television, how that really transformed human consciousness itself. So that's how I uh, was inspired to write this book. I was inspired to write it in the first place by the idea of immortality, and then by trying to imagine, well, what could be as powerful as something like that, and it was media, the way it shapes consciousness, the way it shapes consciousness of the audience, the way it shapes consciousness, consciousness of the, the creator, uh, the way it shapes consciousness of the culture. In another book, on direct, I say it's about terrorists taking over a television station and going on the air and being on, you know, and doing the, doing the, their show, and eventually they get taken over by television because, well, as I say there, it says that um, basically that as Washington is less powerful than Hollywood, show business is more powerful than politics. And we have just had an election in the United States in which two billion dollars, say milliard par million, was spent on television, on television commercials, on, um, on these debates. Um, so that's, that, that, was, that, was the origin of, that was the origin of that novel. And at that time, there was a countercultural revolution, there was all kinds of political things going on, and while it began as a contest sort of between the power of the promise of immortality and the power of show business, it then started to become, it then became kind of specifically uh, political as well. And what happened was what happened. Cette critique des médias euh, résonne encore aujourd'hui. Hein. Il suffit de relire euh, Jacques Baron euh, aujourd'hui. Est-ce que c'était des questions euh, qui étaient aussi très importantes à l'époque ou est-ce que vous étiez presque en, en avance Comment est-ce qu'on se positionnait par rapport aux médias it's talking about consciousness, I was just going to the bathroom here, and there was a, a man who was locked himself in a toilet store, stall, and he, while he's in the toilet, he, very loudly, he's talking on his smartphone to his girlfriend. Uh, people are walking down the street, like zombies, looking into their, looking into their so-called smartphones. Um, politics, in the United States has completely been subsumed by television. Um, in Anderet, the, the terrorists, what they do is they capture a television station, a small crummy television station, because what they are doing is holding the media hostage and using it until the media starts using them. Uh, my latest book takes it one more step further, uh, the Tom, the rêve, 
in which a new media is created in which you can buy a, a, you know, an SD card and on it is a dream and you have a machine that you can put this thing in, put it on your head, go to sleep and your dreams are programmed for better or for worse. You choose, you, you choose your dream, even your unconscious, so-called unconscious uh, hours are also media times. Uh, hey, look, look where we are here. I mean, years ago, this is primarily a book conference. Now, you have manjo, you have uh, a lot of video. You have you have what you have here. Um, no, the media is everywhere, on every level, in everybody's mind, all the time, more and more and more, for better and for worse. It connects the world. And eventually, I mean, I just had to do some stuff where I had to uh, get a rough translation of, I don't know, something in Italian and something in, in French into English. And you go on Google, and you can do that in about 30 seconds. So, in a kind of way, there's also potentiality for bringing people together. It's not all bad. Um, and even in the Tom to Rev, it's the story of something that starts as a schlock Hollywood kind of thing and evolves into a genuine uh, art form. Usually it goes the other way around. Things start as an art form and devolve into show business, show business uh, schlock. But um, in this case, it's, it's the idea of something becoming of, of, of something evolving in a positive way and then being threatened by the video pirates and, and things like that. Um, so I, I'm not against media per se because what I've, what I've said for a long time in general is that technology, science, um, is morally neutral. All of it is no morally neutral. Media, nuclear energy, uh, chemistry, genetic engineering, is all morally neutral. It's what people do with it that has a, a, a moral question or a political question to it. You know, it's, it's, it's morally neutral. It's morally neutral. Jacques Baron a été, euh, on va faire un petit arrêt sur image, il a été publié en feuilleton dans la revue Muse World, on en parlera demain avec Michael Moorcock. Racontez-nous simplement quelle était un peu l'ambiance à l'époque dans Muse World et pour les auteurs de science-fiction. C'était comment <rire> Well, um, my, uh, new, you know, the, the, the so-called new wave phenomenon was really three things at least. One, no, let's make that four. Uh, one was, the simplest one, was to free science fiction from taboos, from censorship, from having to be treated as a literature for children, uh, and to become, you know, to be able to write about sex, about politics, uh, and so forth. Uh, This was the Dangerous Visions version uh, of Harlan Ellison, uh, which I was also publishing. Michael Moorcock um, agreed with that, but there were two other things, or maybe three, that were important. Uh, the idea was that, as I said, that science fiction deals, was dealing with things of genuine visionary uh, political cultural importance in a, in a very trivial and simple manner and so-called you know, establishment literary fiction was using great greater te technical sophistication better writing to examine the lint in its own navel it was all very internal it was not dealing with the interaction between the outside world as a whole and the consciousness of the characters. It was too focused 
on the internal lives of the characters. Whereas science fiction wasn't paying much attention to that, it was all the kind of external gadgetry. So one idea was to, on the one hand, improve science fiction by opening it up to the sophisticated literary um, methods and, and prose of sophisticated mainstream fiction. And on the other hand, to rescue that sort of uh, fiction from the dead end it was in. Uh, and that, then the, but then there was another really technical idea of Mike's, uh, which is kind of harder to explain. Uh, hmm. The idea was that uh, prose fiction had to deal, was dealing with the, with the surface reality of whatever the story was about. Um, whereas poetry could take something as a given, a, a, a story, and sort of, sort of glisse dans le surface comme comme un bouteille dans 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 la mer. Could 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 well. All right, the only way I can explain this is that, is that Mike wrote the um, Jerry Cornelius Tetralogy at that time, four novels, where the story, the actual story, the plot, the characters, were all the same, but the novels were all quite different, because the way he chose to tell the story each time was different. Um, so that was the four parts of the new way, a very complicated, very, uh, more complicated uh, literary phenomenon than, than people generally generally think. It's, it's not just political, it's not just, um, you know, science fiction versus speculative fiction, but it's also um, a kind of thing that only was that really was interesting to, to writers, uh, like Ballard, for example, was, who became whatever he became, uh, was strongly influenced, strongly influenced by this. Est-ce qu'il y avait une émulation entre des auteurs de News World, justement, où chacun était un petit peu dans son coin Est-ce qu'on peut dire qu'il y a eu une école autour de, de, de ce magazine I'm not sure I understand it, but if I do understand it, was there a... It was... No, I mean, everybody, you, you could tell who was really involved, in the new wave, by, every, by whoever denied that they were involved in the new wave. The idea was not a school of writing, the idea was to individualize writing even more, to, 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 to free up individual writers from the, very, the concept of, of genre, uh, which I mean, mysteries are defined by you have to have a detective or somebody who acts like a detective and, and a murder or some other kind of crime. Uh, a Western has to take place in the West. Uh, and, 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 at that, and so forth. A nurse novel has to take place with nurses in a hospital. Genres. Um, and at that point, uh, science fiction was something like, you know, I mean, if you look at the paintings, and, and, and the book covers all around here, you can see it. You have, you have weird looking aliens, you have spaceships, you have planets, uh, so uh, you have a certain kind of plot of, of that sort of thing, the science fiction of the 30s into the 40s, into the early 50s. It was a certain kind of adventure fiction with um, robots, spaceships, other, other worlds, things like that. And the idea was to, the, the idea was to write a, a, a fiction like that that was free of the formula, of the formula. That's why they, they tried, to, tried to call it speculative fiction instead of science fiction, but practically hedging the bets because it was still SF. 
so they could put their own book if they had to. Um, so, in a way, um, this was, you know, the revolution in the, uh, in a way, when it came to influence in science fiction, won completely. Now, a thing like Jack Barron, which was denounced on the floor of the British Parliament as, as, as filth, and, and, and I was called a nameless degenerate, among other things. Um, now, uh, when you see what, what you can publish now in the same public, you know, science fiction the same, in the same publishers, uh, people probably wonder, well, what was that all about? Um, because that was one. Uh, you're now also seeing just recently so-called, you know, literary writers who did not come up through the science fiction subculture were not writing genre uh, are turning to writing speculative fiction. Uh, Gary Steingart, um, Chabon, um, uh, Michel Welbeck, Maurice Dantec, um, uh, and, and more recently, well, writers going in the other direction, like uh, the Blois, the last novel of, of, of Ronald Wagner. Uh, so that has happened to the idea of, of, of freeing up the prose style from being literate, a uh, literate of, from being, what's the word in English? Uh, from having to be, you know, transparent prose that was not poetically adventurous, that has gone the way of the dinosaurs also. Uh, whether mainstream literary fiction has been liberated is another, is another story. Probably not. Uh, but it was... Uh, it was a revolution that was won more than it was lost. On, on va avancer sur l'échelle du temps et en 72 paraît Rêve de fer, autre grand classique. Alors je vous pose un petit peu la, la même question. Hein. Euh, Rêve de fer, pour ceux qui ne l'auraient pas lu, on, on découvre un, un Hitler écrivain de fantasy. <rire> Comment est née l'idée et qu'est-ce que vous aviez envie de faire avec ce Rêve de fer well, I was living in London at the time, at the New World's time, and the magazine was always in economic trouble. And Mike Borkoff was writing, the year I was there, he wrote 11 novels, 11 novels, one a month practically, or more actually, to support the magazine. And it was all heroic fantasy. Um, and so I said, how, 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 it was very successful stuff, really sold. And so I asked Mike, uh, how do you do this? And he said, well, I, I, I didn't do as well until I figured out how to do it. Which was that you take uh, historical events or a, mythic, or a mythic cycle or something like that. And you put a lot of phallic um, Freudian imagery in it and that's what works. And then it came into my head, I said, oh, that, you know, like Nazi Germany? Uh, because, well, because, because, because as I learned more deeply later, that's how Hitler did it. Uh, so, I had the idea, uh, somehow it came to me, of hit, that, that, that a certain kind of science fiction, so-called heroic fantasy of the time, uh, was psychologically similar uh, to Nazi Germany. And then it was an exploration of why and how, and, uh, and how Hitler did it, uh, which required me to learn his style to write a book um, that was written by Hitler, which meant I had to channel Adolf Hitler. Uh, now, generally speaking, I'm a kind of writer that enjoys the process of writing. I really like doing it. A lot of writers say, no, I don't like doing it. I like being an author. I go to conventions, get drunk, and you know, get laid, and stuff like that. But um, I actually enjoy the process. Not this book. Um, 
Uh, this book was really unpleasant to write. Um, um, and for years, I hated it myself. I said, boy, I hate that book. Um, but then as I was winning literary prizes, and getting good reviews, it was published all over the world, people understood it, nobody said it was a Nazi book, not even when it was banned in Germany. Um, and it finally realized that I didn't hate the book. I hated the, the experience of writing the thing. Uh, and I hope I never do something like that again. I'm not saying it won't happen, but boy, that was... I had a poster in front of the, of the typewriter, which there had been some story about um, experiments by a psychologist in torture, and, a, a, and the poster was an Esquire, and I cut the page out because the illustration was the famous World War II of Uncle Sam, you know, pointed, Uncle Sam wants you. I don't know if people know that here, but, but they had done Hitler in the same mode, and he's saying, the Führer brach dich. The Führer wants you. And I was staring at that thing while I was writing this book. And, um, it, uh, it, you know, and it's a paradoxical book. I'm gonna, uh, 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 what I had to do to write that, as to, for that to be a good novel, was to write a terrible novel. <laughs> uh, a really awful novel. Uh, because that's what it required. Uh, that's why it was such a horrible experience, but worthwhile in the end. Est-ce que aujourd'hui, euh, avec euh, le recul, est-ce que vous avez le sentiment qu'on pourrait écrire le même roman en mettant de nouveau Adolf Hitler en personnage principal euh, Parfois, on a l'impression qu'on n'ose plus ce, ce genre de fiction. Est-ce que vous pensez qu'on pourrait faire rêve de faire aujourd'hui would I write it today again? No, never. Oh, I'll write this. Oh, oh, oh here's a story. Oh, oh. After it comes out, it was a period when everybody was doing their series their, in, in their own universe, you know. And I, uh, I didn't want to do anything like that. But I'm having lunch with a, an editor who I guess should be nameless. No, 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 I was showing him a card that she shouldn't be nameless. And as a joke, as a joke, I said, well, uh, I could always do uh, the swastika side. Because in the end of Ray the Fair, the, the Nazis go off to conquer the universe with clones of the SS and clones of, of, of Ferry Jagger, the Hitler character. And I said, well, um, each, they, I could do a whole series of novels. Each, in each one, the Nazis land on somebody else's franchise universe, like Dark Over or, or Larry Niven's Ring World or something, and they come out of their spaceships with, with all their Wehrmacht material and, and Luftwaffe, and they conquer somebody's universe. And the whole thing will be called the Swastika Saga. And I said, and I don't even have to put my name on it. It's all like Hitler. Um, and to make it worse, we give them, and I don't have to write them either, because they say, well, we find the person whose universe we're going to destroy, and we give them the first chance to write the novel, and if they don't want to do it, we give it to their worst enemy. So she says to me, can I talk to my agent about this? I said, it's a joke, it's a joke. <laughs> yeah, I know, but she talks to her agent, the agent calls me and says, well, can I talk to her? Well, the Jim Bain, who was a publisher at the time, it's a joke. It's a joke. Yeah, I know it's a joke, but... So I called my agent, Jane Rogos, and said, Jane, I tell her the story, I said, Jane, I'm waiting for somebody to tell me to stop. And she says, we must be careful to keep the merchandising rights. Uh, now, today, if Jim Bain, to his credit, did not buy it, but um, today I think I could sell it. Today I think I could sell it. I mean, I could sell it to Disney. I mean, Disney just wants Star Wars. They might buy this. You know, you know, I mean, they could dress up Mickey Mouse in an SS uniform. And, you know, and, and do whatever. It's, yeah, I, it, it's very scary. Um, Alan Curnow, the director, wanted to make a movie of this. 
and we talked about it, how would we do it, we never came up with anything. Now I know how to do it. Um, because it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, a, it wouldn't be about a hit with a writer, they would be a heavy metal rock band. And we would have the album, or we'd have the costumes, and have the whole thing. Uh, please don't anybody try and buy the rights to do this for me, I won't sell them. Euh, le, le, le temps file, ça fait déjà une demi-heure euh, qu'on qu est ensemble. Je voulais parler, euh, de, alors ça concerne peut-être un petit peu moins euh, votre écriture, mais votre départ pour Paris en 88 et puis en, ensuite votre retour, quel est votre rapport aux États-Unis C'est une question complexe. Uh, hein. <rire> well, I've written about a dozen novels about that. Uh, what do I feel generally now Well, it's also about Europe. Because what I. Uh, it, 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 uh, if you look at my, well, I, actually I wrote a novel about this, and that is uh, Greenhouse Summer, which is Blue Coming Our Orange here, which is not my title. And the idea there was, aside from the fact that it's the racial forage of the planet, uh, okay, communism has collapsed, but that doesn't mean that Marx is wrong about capitalism. So this is after the collapse of both communism and capitalism and what comes next. And I think we are seeing that right now uh, here. The globalized system in America and in Europe doesn't work. It doesn't work because it can't work. Because the prime directive of capitalism is to make things as cheaply as you can and sell them for as much money as you can get. And the more successful a process like that becomes, you end up in a situation where you can make things for almost nothing, but nobody can afford to buy them. Uh, and the whole thing collapses. What you've had in Europe and in the States is a virtual economy uh, that dominates the real economy. The virtual economy is like a casino economy. It's Las Vegas. It's a null-sum game. People are betting on this and betting on that, derivatives, uh, all kinds of crap like that. And they're not producing anything of social or, or, or real economic value. It's, it, it's a casino, it's gambling. In Europe, what's happened is much the same thing, but worse still, uh, somehow, because the IMF and the World Bank and the uh, European Bank have become so dominant, um, you have a situation where countries like Spain, we get to Greece, Spain, Greece, France was, did a lot less of this, England, uh, they take the debts, the big debts of banks and they make them sovereign debts of governments. And that doesn't work. It, you know, and then they say, well, we have to have austerity because they're running such a deficit. Well, it doesn't work. You see that it doesn't work. It can't work. Because as I said yesterday somewhere, um, this is like an aim dollar cheese with black holes in it. Sooner or later, there are more holes than cheese, and the whole thing is going to collapse. In Europe, you can see it very clearly. It's in the process of collapsing. It can't work. Uh, in the States, the same thing. Uh, part of this is a thing called monetarism, which was an idea of, of uh, I don't know, a various school of economics which said that by manipulating the value of the currency a little bit and the interest rates of loans a little bit, you can really have great big control and effects on the real economy. And it's true, except the, except the vice versa is, in order to lower, say, how much interest of the French government or the Spanish government or whatever pays on its bonds, you have to create an economic catastrophe. You, uh, why should people have to have lower salaries or no jobs at all so that these loans can be 2% lower than some arbitrary number set by the banks. It's, it's insane. It can't work and it isn't working. 
Um, so I think, I mean, I've, so I, I wrote uh, Blue Common Orange about this, and, and what I said there was these banks and these economic institutions, they wrote the biggest rubber check in history, and they passed it off on themselves. And that's exactly what has happened. Um, and I've written a new novel, which, hasn't, which I just finished, called Police State, set in Louisiana, in which they go one step too far, and they try and get the police to evict themselves from their own houses. <laughs> Because they can't pay because they, they because they can't pay the mortgage payment, and it proceeds from there um, in in Louisiana fashion. Uh, that's in short what I think about what's happening. But I, I would say I've written a lot of books about this. But that's that's what's happening now. On, on, on le sent euh, toute votre littérature est engagée. C'est c'est votre manière de de parler au monde la littérature comme engagement. Are, my, are all my books politically engaged? Like that? Yeah. Not all of them. Not all of them. Uh, uh, Le Temps de Rêve is not directly political, except that it's political on a Jungian level. Pas, it, pas, pas politique, mais en tout cas, c'est un regard sur la société. Pas politicien. Voilà, c'est ça. But, uh, you can't say that in English very well. Uh, pas politique, politicien, mais. Parce que le, le, le politique ultime est la politique de la conscience. On change la conscience, on change tout. Même, même la musique, par exemple, le rock machine. Ça, c'est pas politique, politique de red, mais c'est la politique de conscience dans le milieu de, de, de rock and roll, de musique. And I think, in that sense, I'm always writing something that's, in that sense, politically or at least psychologically and socially engaged, because to me, the essence of science fiction or speculative fiction, or really should be of fiction in general, the most interesting thing is the interaction between the total external world and the interior consciousness of the characters. And you really can't write that kind of thing without being political in some kind of manner. Est-ce que c'est pour ça finalement que vous avez choisi la science-fiction Est-ce que c'est pour ça que finalement vous avez choisi yes, la science-fiction Yes, 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 yes. That, that is why I write science-fiction. Uh, or to look at it another way, uh, the way liter literature is regarded critically, if you write that kind of thing, it's regarded as science fiction, whether it's science fiction or not. Uh, for instance, uh, On Direct was published not as science fiction in the States, then it was published uh, as science fiction here, I think, and then Folio published it as a polar, and On Direct was published in the same kind of manner. It was published as a science fiction novel first, and then it was published as a straight folio. Uh, so it's really kind of arbitrary, because I think if there's one, one thread in, in, in everything I've done, it's that I try to write about how consciousness affects the world, the exterior world, the interface between human, between individual consciousness and the body politic, culture. Uh, because consciousness and culture are, create each other, and that's politics too. Not just politics, but you can't you can't write that kind of thing without, without dealing with, with the political dimension and the economic dimension. Un petit mot sur euh, le temps du rêve qui, qui sort chez Fayard. Là. Euh, pareil, quelle est un petit peu l'origine de ce roman Vous en avez parlé, des, des, on peut vivre des rêves. Qu'est-ce qui vous a donné un petit peu l'envie de l'écrire Well, for a long time, I've been interested in dreams. 
the owner and I are writing a thing called Psychosomics, which is about the interface between non-fiction, between the, between the experience of consciousness and the actual physical matrix. And part of what we did, we, did, we went to some dream laboratories and, 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 and so forth. But I also had some very strange dreams and, um, in which I know things I shouldn't know, uh, in which I can enter the dream and change the story, and I believe that somehow dreams and creativity, at this, the actual state of your mind when you're doing something creative, when it's working, are somehow the same thing. So, uh, I, so that in, in a paradoxical way, we know that dreams are fantasies, but we also know that they're real because they're not dream. So that gave me the idea to imagine um, if you had a device in which you could have dreams as if they were movies or television shows or closer video games, uh, that it would be an exploration of that um, at the same time, each dream would be a story in itself, but the evolution of, of the art from schlock Hollywood stuff into a genuine, very deep art form, and then it's attacked by uh, viruses and internet pirates, and it's rescued from that in a way that if it completely works, for some readers will teach you how to create your own dreams while you are in them. I'm not saying everybody who reads this book will be able to do that, but I think some people will. And so to write this was also something from video games, because in video games, the viewpoint character, the lead character, is you, the player of the game. So in this, the, the, the lead character in every dream is the reader. So the whole thing is written in second person singular. To a vous, depending on the dream. Um, and I... Um, some people say it's my best novel. I don't know. I don't. You know. I, I don't. That's like saying if you have a lot of children, which is you know, unless you didn't rob me, you don't say anything about that. Um, so it, it's a long, long process. I've always been fascinated by this because, and also what they say about dreams, uh, people dream of black and white. I don't dream of black and white. People don't remember their dreams. I remember my dreams. Um, and the creative dream, there really is something deeply connected between the actual state of creativity, conscious state of creativity, and, and what happens in a dream. And I sort of believe, in a way, that somehow, sometimes, you connect to some kind of collective, I wouldn't say you know, the collective Jungian collective unconscious, but some kind of common consciousness and that there can be a physical basis for it because when you're asleep, um, your brain is in a different electrochemical state and it may be that there's some kind, there can be some kind of leakage between one person dreaming and somebody else picking it up because it's an electromagnetic phenomenon. And the more they get deeply into the quantum effects of, of molecular biology, the more possible this becomes. I don't say that I am sure of this or that I exactly believe it, but I well, in another book, in, in, in um, 
You're like, Bobby knew there's a kind of mantra which is, what is, is real. If you experience something, you really experienced it. You can't say you didn't. And I have had dreams where I learned things that I couldn't know, and I just don't learn things that I couldn't know. I learned things I don't even care about. Like one was like how to coach a basketball team. I didn't really care about that. Um, it was about, I don't know, how to do some kind of tax accountancy. You know, some dreams are really boring, but um, things I couldn't know. Things I couldn't know. Um, so that, from a lot of different directions, I was thinking about doing something like this for years and years and years. Uh, and I, and it sort of began in L.A. Parmenu, there's some of that there, the idea of the doorway. If you can step through the doorway, you can summon the creative process, which is somehow the same thing as the dream time. Alors, le, le temps file, il nous reste une petite dizaine de minutes. Est-ce que quelqu'un a une question Profitez-en à poser à Norman Spina. Il y en a deux devant. On vous apporte le micro. Oui, bonjour. Euh, je voulais poser une question par rapport à, aux avaleurs de vie. Savoir quelle était la place que vous lui donnez dans votre œuvre en général. Et plus précisément, en fait, le héros fait, fait face à l'impossibilité de retranscrire une expérience physique. Et pour la retransmettre, il invente une nouvelle fiction et recrée une fiction comme ça. Et je voulais savoir un peu votre positionnement par rapport à ça, de savoir de quelle manière l'homme vit en se créant des fictions et en se projetant dans une fiction jusqu'à ce qu'elle devienne réelle ou pas. Quite um, Alors, la, la première question, c'est les avaleurs de vide. Euh, oh, les avaleurs de vide Ah, 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 ah. Oui, 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 oui. oui. Oui, oui, ça c'est la, la même idée et une autre, une autre forme, exact. Et, 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 et avant de vivre, c'est on, 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 on trouve dans le cerveau, en ce qui est le There is a pouce in your head that gives you a three-dimensional experience. I, 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 I mean, more than a three-dimensional experience, a full sensory experience, and there's a full sensory art form. Uh, that people experience, which is exactly, which is exactly like, like the dream time. Yes, yes. Uh, only in, only in, in out of the David, it's also a communication device. You can be inside somebody else. It's one step a little bit further, but yeah, that is really, yeah, but the, the beginning of, 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 of the stuff, of, of what I did in the Tom in the Tom Trail. Du coup, de quelle manière il y a cette idée, je pense, euh, que le rêve ou la projection fictionnelle, la science-fiction, euh, matérialise le réel. De quelle manière on ne vivrait pas déjà dans un univers science-fictionnel Wow Qu'est-ce que c'est le réel C'est la ultimate question. Mais c'est vraiment la ultimate question. Qu'est-ce que c'est le réel Um, why is there something instead of nothing? Um, and we don't have an answer to that. Religion doesn't have an answer to that. Science doesn't have an answer for that. And I don't have an answer for that. Um, but it's exploring this. Yeah, um, science fiction, or speculative fiction, is inherently the literature of that sort of thing because you are creating things that don't exist, but if it's real science fiction, that are possible, that can't be passed off as impossible fantasy, uh, that in the end may end up being created somehow. Um, Trips to other planets, maybe even time travel, um, robots certainly, uh, things that were Fantasies become realities. Um, and I think that it's not impossible that the dream master, the device that gives people, the, you know, that people can play their dreams on in the Tom Tereb, someday, 
can actually be can, can be made. I can see or I can be done. Because if dream if I am really getting dreams, getting dream information and images from other people's dreams because there's an electromagnetic transference, well, in theory, you could put the electromagnetic imagery as with a movie or video game on a chip or on a DVD and then create the imagery and so forth in somebody else's dreams. I mean, in a kind of way, when you're really writing, when somebody's really writing well, when they're writing a novel or a short story, they're doing that. They're doing that. It's not like a movie. It's not where you're getting concrete images. It's not like radio where you're getting concrete sounds. It's conceptual. Uh, and, 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 and the novel is like that. You're not really seeing these scenarios in the sense that I'm giving you a natural video picture. You're not really hearing it. You're getting a you're getting it transmitted to your consciousness by the literary process, which is not direct in the way that films or video games or, or, or to some extent music are. So in a way, um, that is the same thing potentially as taking some concepts like that, putting it on, 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 on a recording medium and broadcasting it directly into somebody's brain. That's Les Avalier de Vie, and maybe that stuff can actually be created. Who knows? I mean, a, a, a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, a million years from now, that's science, eh? Monsieur, il, il nous reste trois minutes. Uh, well, uh, when I am telling my children about science fiction, they just answer by fantasy. A um, lot of the ring of this type of literature. What do you think of this evolution? Do you think it's definitive evolution? Is it good or not? Well, I think evolution is good or bad. It depends. Uh, well, I don't think... Uh, what I have said elsewhere is that the lunatics have taken over the asylum. Uh, Evolu we, we have transcended natural evolution for better or for worse. Um, your children, I don't know how old they are, but they probably are walking around with a, with, 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 with a earplug in their, in their ear and a smartphone in their hand and um, ruining their thumbs by texting. And um, that's a profound, I mean, that's really, that's really evolution. Uh, um, television, when it was invented, real revolution. Um, conscious revolution. So we are evolving ourselves for better or for worse. Um, the question is, do we really know what we're doing? Um, and sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. And it's the same thing with natural evolution. Um, the way it works, the way natural evolution worked is uh, creatures, including humans, evolve to perfect their survival in a certain ecological situation. All very well and good until the situation changes. And then something new has to evolve in order to survive. Um, we, we, I think we have transcended that process, but we have no guarantee that it's going to come out right. Um, it's just like what I was saying about what's happening with globalized economy. Um, it's not, you know, it, this thing of all, people thought it was, you know, well, Francis Fukuyama said the end of history. Yeah, really the end of history. But he said that, you know, liberal capitalism and democracy, that's the end of history. Everything is going to be like that. It's all going to be global. Well, we see that it doesn't work. We don't know what's going to evolve out of it. I mean, we can imagine things, but uh, 
Evolution is better than devolution. <laughs> but there's no guarantee. Ben, on, on, on arrive à la fin de cette conférence. Merci à vous euh, d'être resté pour euh, écouter No Man's Finrad. Vous allez pouvoir retrouver en dédicace et puis euh, bien sûr les, les conférences continuent. Merci à tous. Merci à vous.